beneath our planet's surface, ancient giants sleep. Not earthquakes, not ordinary volcanoes, but super volcanoes, capable of wiping out life as we know it. If one erupts, the sky darkens, the sun fades, and the world spirals into starvation and ice. Welcome to Doomsday Broadcast. This is what could happen if a supervolcano erupts. Beneath the Earth's crust lie supervolcanoes, vast, silent forces capable of changing the planet. These are far more than massive eruptions. They're global catastrophes. When a supervolcano erupts, it can unleash over 1,000 cubic kilometers of ash, more than a hundred times what Mount St. Helens released. The fallout could bury entire nations, block sunlight for months, and trigger a years-long volcanic winter. Only a few of these giants exist on Earth. Yellowstone Caldera, hidden beneath the forests of Wyoming. Campi Flagre, smoldering beneath the streets of Naples, Lake Toba, lurking in the jungles of Indonesia, Taupo, sleeping beneath New Zealand's serene lakes. Each is powerful enough to poison the sky, shut down agriculture, and collapse the systems that sustain modern civilization. One eruption could do more than cause devastation. It could change life on Earth forever. Six months before the eruption, the signs begin, quiet, almost invisible at first. The ground starts to swell. Pressure builds deep underground. Magma rises slowly, like a tide trapped in stone. Tremors, small at first, become daily occurrences, growing stronger with each passing week. Sulfur dioxide begins to leak into the atmosphere, invisible but toxic, hinting at what's coming. By the third month, in a place like Yellowstone, the caldera could rise more than a meter, lifting the earth like a stretched drumhead ready to rupture. By the fifth month, thousands of earthquakes shake the region every day. Panic spreads. Authorities close the skies. Evacuations begin in waves. But for millions, especially those living near the epicenter, there's no escape. The clock is running out. Then it happens. No warning. No countdown. The Earth tears open with a sound that shatters the sky. A supervolcano erupts in full force, releasing more energy in moments than a thousand nuclear bombs. A column of ash blasts 50 kilometers into the stratosphere, punching through the atmosphere like a spear of fire and dust. Pyroclastic flows, unstoppable avalanches of molten rock and gas, burst outward at over 400 kilometers per hour. Forests vaporize, cities vanish. Millions die within minutes. But things are only getting started. Ash begins to fall across the land like a toxic blizzard, coating everything in a suffocating gray. Flights are grounded nationwide. Crops are buried and killed. The sun fades behind a thick veil of dust. And for the first time, the world realizes this isn't a local disaster. It's a global one. The ash doesn't stop at borders. It rides the upper atmosphere, carried by winds that circle the Earth. Within days, it begins falling across Europe, Asia, the Middle East. Airports shut down. Trade routes freeze. Sunlight dims by 10%, then 20%. Plants begin to fail. Photosynthesis slows. Respiratory illnesses spike. Hospitals overflow. By the second week, drinking water becomes contaminated with heavy metals. Crops wither. Livestock collapse in their pens. Over 50 million people face food shortages, disease, and infrastructure failure. By the third week, panic becomes chaos. Power grids crash. Communication lines go dead. Martial law is declared in more than 40 countries. Borders close. Governments reel from the shock, and while the ash continues to fall, something more dangerous spreads. Fear. And this is only the beginning. Even as the ash begins to settle, the real damage is only beginning. Sulfur dioxide, blasted high into the stratosphere, 
spreads into a thin veil of aerosols that reflect sunlight away from Earth. Global temperatures begin to drop. By the second month, the average temperature has fallen by 3 degrees Celsius. By the sixth, it falls by 5. Crops that survived the initial fallout now fail in the cold. Rain patterns vanish. The monsoons stop. Deserts expand. July brings snow in places that once sweltered. Rivers freeze where they've never frozen before. In the southern hemisphere, growing seasons are cut in half. In the north, they vanish entirely. The earth has entered a new kind of winter, one not defined by season, but by silence and absence. This is not a pause in climate. It's a collapse. A volcanic winter has begun. As the first year ends, the global food system disintegrates. Fields lie abandoned, choked with ash or frozen solid. Whatever food remains can't be harvested, let alone transported. Fuel is scarce. Infrastructure is crippled. Supermarkets are empty. Trade stops completely, not out of caution, but because there is nothing left to move. In cities, chaos takes hold. Riots flare with growing frequency. Law enforcement and emergency services overwhelmed and undersupplied, vanish from the streets. In rural areas, order dissolves. Families guard dwindling supplies with desperation and firearms. Starvation spreads like a virus. Over 400 million people are already going hungry. Governments stagger, economies collapse, nations close their borders, turning inward in an attempt to survive. And beneath the weight of dust, ice, and fear, hope begins to rot, buried with the last remaining grain. By the second year, Earth's surface has become nearly uninhabitable. Ash storms sweep across the land, choking towns in toxic gray. Even filtered air holds razor-sharp volcanic glass, every breath a danger. The sky never clears. The sun, a pale ghost, offers no warmth. Temperatures hover near freezing, even at the equator. Acid rain poisons rivers. Oceans stir with deadly runoff. Forests die. Wildlife disappears. Ecosystems unravel. The planet turns quiet. Outside sealed bunkers, people vanish. Freezing, suffocating, starving. Homes are tombs. Cities fall silent. No lights. No movement. Nothing remains but dust and cold. Civilization doesn't collapse in a single moment. It fades slowly, breath by breath. And above the buried world, a lifeless wind carries the last echoes of a planet once full of life. By the third year, Earth's surface is a graveyard. Cities lie buried under hardened ash. Forests are gone. Rivers are frozen or poisoned. The air scrapes the lungs. The soil is lifeless. Power grids have failed. There are no broadcasts. No help is coming. Civilization has gone underground. Government bunkers seal shut. Private shelters vanish beneath steel and concrete. Military outposts operate in silence. Above ground, a broken world persists. Lifeless, gray and crumbling. No animals, no crops, only wind and ash. Those left behind vanish into cold, starvation, or madness. The surface is no longer a place for the living. Below, humanity clings to survival, scattered in bunkers and tunnels, cut off from one another. The earth above is lost, and with it, the memory of those who didn't make it. By year five, over 1.5 billion people are confirmed dead, and another two billion remain missing or unaccounted for. The surface world has fallen into eerie silence. No traffic, no lights, no sound except the cold whisper of the wind. Underground, the survivors face mounting challenges. Food stockpiles dwindle rapidly, pushing many to the brink of starvation. Mental health deteriorates as isolation and despair take their toll. Power systems begin to fail one by one, Plunging shelters into darkness, communication between bunkers breaks down, severing vital connections. Those who risk venturing to the surface rarely return. By year seven, 
Entire bunkers go completely silent, their inhabitants lost to the void. Survival no longer depends on innovation or hope. It becomes a test of endurance against overwhelming odds. This is not a post-apocalyptic world. It is a world paused indefinitely. A decade after darkness fell, the ash finally begins to thin. In some parts of the world, the sun, pale and distant, finally breaks through. Temperatures rise by fractions, snow recedes from the ground that never knew winter before, and through cracks in ruined concrete, the first hints of green appear. A weed, a patch of moss, a fragile reminder that life still lingers. Deep underground, shelter doors creak open. Survivors step out, their skin pale, their eyes unadjusted to light. They're not heroes or victors, they're remnants. The world they step into has no borders, no nations, no power grids. History lies buried beneath layers of ash and silence. This is not the return of civilization. It's something entirely new, fragile, uncertain, and it begins not with hope or triumph, but with cautious footsteps across poisoned ground. This may sound like doomsday fiction, but it's not. Supervolcanoes are real, and they've erupted with catastrophic force. About 74,000 years ago, Lake Toba exploded so violently it nearly wiped out humanity. Our DNA still shows the damage. Taupo reshaped New Zealand in an instant. Yellowstone, the most infamous, erupted 640,000 years ago leaving a crater the size of a state. These weren't accidents. They're part of Earth's natural cycle, a destructive rhythm millions of years in the making. Right now, we're in a pause between eruptions. Scientists monitor tremors, gases, and land shifts, but no tool can predict when the pressure will break, when magma will surge, when the Earth will crack. The clock is ticking, and the next eruption could end the world as we know it. We like to believe we control this planet, that our cities, our technology, and our global systems make us untouchable. But all it takes is one eruption, one violent breath from beneath the earth, and everything we've built could vanish in a cloud of ash and silence. This was Doomsday Broadcast. Like, subscribe. Stay aware, because the next catastrophe might already be rumbling beneath your feet.